I am James Swanick, and today we are speaking with Julia Price, a singer-songwriter based in Los Angeles who recently broke up with alcohol. Or at least she broke up with her prior relationship with alcohol. So she went 18 months alcohol-free, and now she drinks on a case-by-case basis on occasion. And we're going to hear a little bit about Julia's story in just a second. And besides being a singer-songwriter, Julia also does musical workshops with entrepreneurs to help them get into their heart in a more expansive way, which sounds beautiful, which I'd love to dig in a little bit on. Julia, great to have you here. Welcome. So great to be here, James. That was like the best intro. You really have a a special talent for that. (laughs) Oh, thank you very much. And getting people to stop drinking. You're very talented. Very talented guy. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. So tell us just a little bit more about what you do and with the musical workshops and your singing, singing and songwriting career. We'd love to know a little bit about that. Yeah. So I, um, I pretty much always played music. I never really thought growing up it was a career that I could actually do. And so I just picked what was around me. My mom was a producer, a TV producer. So I would, I loved going to the studio with her and seeing her kind of like run the room and organize everything. And I loved that sort of adrenaline rush that you get with live TV. Um, So I ended up working at Good Morning America as an intern right after college. They hired me. I was there for years And I kept kind of getting pulled into music things like, you know, how it's one of those things you resist it, but the universe will make sure that it, you know, tells you do this other thing. And so basically I just kept getting asked by friends to do music things. A friend of mine asked me to open for him at the bitter end. And I, which was a venue in New York city. It's um, pretty well known in the music scene there. And so I started playing there consistently and some of the GMA good morning America crew would come and watch me. Sometimes they watched the show. They mentioned it the next day in the hallway, the anchor overheard, asked to hear my music, put me on air. And then all of a sudden I had press. And so that kind of led me to make the decision of going for it full time and starting to tour and all that sort of thing. Um, And then I got to a point where I got really, really into personal development work. And because of it, the way that I was pursuing music wasn't necessarily as aligned as it used to be. Um, And I started really loving just like any sort of way I could break down old patterns or walls. And um, the more I did that with myself, I love to kind of help people around me get to that place too. And I just thought one day, well, what if I combine all these like musical exercises that I've learned and things I've learned while touring and performing that have broken down my barriers and I can kind of like put it into a comprehensive workshop that people who are maybe not comfortable being creative in front of others could do together. Um, All that to say, basically now I do that in more corporate settings and uh, get to work with people, you know, sometimes who are in suits. I mean, you know, you speak all over the world, you go in there are suits and by the end of it, they're like freestyle rapping on stage. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> with their coworkers, and um that's so rewarding I, I get a lot more out of that than just you know a regular performance yeah so at, at, at most of the audience that you're performing to now are they naturally more closed off than open and with your music and with your workshops you try to open them up a little little bit more is that right yeah I mean that's a great way of putting it I think it's one thing to go to a show to watch someone perform. It's another when you all of a sudden are told like, Hey, this is an immersive experience. Cause sometimes people don't know. And I can see like the look of horror on their face, (laughs) like, wait, what is happening? Um, but that's why it's, uh, it's really fun to see like the slow, you know, like, okay, maybe I could try this. Oh, that wasn't as scary as I thought. And like, you know, it's a, it's a gradual thing. I don't just go in and like get on stage, although I have done that as well. But <laughs> well, it might be a, a nice kind of segue into maybe your relationship with alcohol was a gradual thing, or maybe you jumped right in with two feet at the beginning with alcohol. Um, and then maybe it was a gradual or slow kind of breaking up period. So mm-hmm. let's just go back to the beginning. Um, just tell us a little bit about you know, where and how you think alcohol first 
came into your life? A lot of folks say, you know, when they grew up, wherever they grew up, they saw mum and dad drinking at the table. It wasn't a big deal. No one was getting drunk or anything. But, you know, it was normalised. Just drinking a glass of wine or having a half a bottle was very normal. And then when you go through school and college, obviously drinking a lot more is kind of cool and fun and all of that kind of stuff. And then when you get into your 20s and 30s, it's, again, it's normalised in a different way. It's no one thinks anything is weird about sharing a bottle of wine or having some drinks over dinner, et cetera. So I'm just curious, what was your introduction to alcohol and how did that um, develop over the years, I guess? Yeah. I mean, my introduction, it's funny because I remember I had a fake ID when I was 16 in order to go to nightclubs, but I didn't drink. I didn't have a fake ID to drink. I just loved going out dancing. So I would just, I never understood why anyone needed to drink because it was so freeing for me to just, you know, have the lights and like, well, I guess it would now be considered old school hip hop. And like, it was, cause we're getting older. Um, but I, ne- I didn't understand it. And then, um, I remember the first time I got really drunk. Um, I, I kind of skipped there, but basically I didn't really, I didn't understand the point of drinking. And then I just, I think maybe my beginning of college, it was just sort of normalized around me. So once in a while, I'd like try to drink. I didn't like the taste of it and like the feeling I'm like, whatever. But I remember the first time I got blackout drunk was actually by mistake. I had, I went to like a little, um, picnic in the summer, a barbecue picnic thing. And someone made, um, rum or vodka soaked watermelon and left it on the table And I didn't know that. And I was eating the watermelon just as I would eat, you know, on a hot summer day, not thinking about it. And the next thing I know, like, I feel really weird. And through conversation realized I was really drunk on watermelon. (laughs) So it was not intentional, but I think that that did open up one thing for me was that I could black out. And I think that's a very scary thing when I had, you know, my friends telling me, oh, you said this and you did this. And I'm like, I don't remember it. That's weird. And so in general, I'm someone who's very sensitive. Like if I have more than a cup of coffee, I'm my whole day is, you know, very wiry and kind of weird. And I get the shakes and all that. And, um, alcohol was the same thing. I'd, you know, watch a lot of my friends as we go out drinking in college and stuff like that. It became more normalized. And I would just feel like I'd get to a certain point where my body would just be like, you had too much. And I just, you know, wasn't making the best decisions and stuff like that. But I think at that age, you blame it on youth. You blame it on like, we're all crazy. We're doing this thing together. Like you might go home with someone and like you laugh about it with your friends. But I think getting into my thirties, I was like, not only is this not like fun and charming to make these stupid mistakes anymore. It's like very, it actually has an impact on your life. You know, like I would say things I didn't mean to say, or I'd, if I was in a great mood, it was fine. But if I was like sad or angry about something, it would come out when I was drinking and it wouldn't come out in ways that were like productive or kind even. Um, and so I just started seeing that and I'm like, I don't, I don't like that feeling of not having full control over my reactions or even sometimes fully remembering them. Mm. Um, and then slowly my body just stopped responding to certain things. Like it didn't want to drink vodka anymore. It just would, I'd feel really sick from it. I'm like, okay. And then I didn't, I kept like cutting down certain drinks and I just had a very clear moment. I remember I was single and I went, so now at this point I was pretty much only drinking rosé because my body would like literally reject anything else I had, like even a glass of red wine. My body was like, nope. It would just like, you know, I'd be puking the next day from one glass of wine. So I was getting all the signs, like take a break. And I also knew, like, I, I knew for a while there was something in my gut that was like, you don't need to drink. You don't even have, like, I have more fun not drinking. It's crazy. Like I don't have more fun when I drink, but I think it's like you said, it's so normalized around you. It's a thing, you know, people say, do you want to go out and get a drink? Okay. Like, so Then, um, I was on this date with this guy. I don't even remember his name. He was like British or something. He had a cool, sexy accent. Of course, he's thrilled to to hear you refer to him that way. (laughs) I know. 
<laughs> Went on this date with this guy. I don't even remember his name. It could have been British, but I don't remember. <laughs> it was not forgettable. <laughs> I mean, uh, so, you know, I think it was more about the lesson than the guy for that date. So we went out and, you know, British people... I'm going to stereotype here, but they can drink a lot. And so I was like trying to keep up with him. And I'm like, all right. And so I was on like my third glass of rosé and I was feeling pretty drunk. And um, I had this moment and I never went home with a stranger, mostly out of safety. Like, I, you know, I wish I could say it was like, I really have no filter in this conversation. I'm just realizing, but I wish I could say like, you know, I just, I don't know. But basically I was just like always so scared of having someone I didn't know in my house or being in someone I didn't know's house. But so here I am with this guy, barely know. I'm like, come back to my house. I'll like play some music for you, which like a weird moves I was putting on him. And um, I get into my house and I remember like, you know, kind of like walking in where you, you're not like walking fully straight, whatever, kind of dizzy. And I start playing piano for him and I turn around and he's on my bed. And I had this moment of panic of like, there is a guy I don't know in my bed, in my space. I need him to get out right now. And there was nothing he didn't do anything. It just was like the intimacy of being in my room. And I remember I said to him, I was like, Hey, you have to go. And he's like, ha ha ha. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Whatever. And I'm like, no, no, you got it. You got to go. Like you got to get out right now. And he's like, Oh, okay. And like, luckily he was very gentlemanly, but I just, um, there was something about that. I woke up the next day and I was like, I do not like the decisions I'm making. Like enough is enough. And sorry, it's such a long winded way of saying how I got to this point, but I went to physical therapy because I, um, was getting stuff done for my back and it was very important that I be there. And I remember leaving physical therapy to go have to puke like three times from the alcohol. And I'm like, this is not a sustain, like none of this is self-love. Like, I don't feel good about myself. I'm, you know, I have to either change something or I'm going to continue to break trust with me because I'm not like the person that I know I could be right now. And, and I felt very clear that it was because of alcohol. First of all, I want to thank you for being so open and honest and transparent. Thank you for sharing that story. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it sounds like you had a scary realization. It sounds like you put all the things together and, and in that moment you were like, huh, I'm not making good choices when I am under the influence of what I call attractively packaged poison. Um, did it feel like an aha moment? Did it feel like a breakthrough moment or, and was that breakthrough moment enough for you to actually change your drinking behaviors? Because if there's anything we know about human behavior is that sometimes even having an aha moment, still you choose to stay in those somewhat damaging behaviors. So yeah. That is a great question. And I, I kind of, even for that very, what I felt was sort of a long answer, I, I had to cut out so many different examples of that. I mean, luckily that's like a pretty, um, you know, nothing was lost in that situation, but I've definitely, yeah. I mean, I, over the years, I, you know, sent like like a, some weird texts and some weird emails. And I, and I would wake up and go, Oh my gosh, like I have to not, like, I can't drink like that. Like I can't do it. I had so many aha moments, but it wasn't, there was something that was so visceral about here. I am trying to do this thing to get better, to make my body better from this car accident I had was why I was in physical therapy. And I'm like, I'm having to leave this room to go vomit. <laughs> like, that that's not an alignment. Like there's something really out of alignment there. And so, um, the other thing that happened, you know, it's actually interesting because I remember you were doing the alcohol free stuff and I just, I think it's like through conversations you and I had, or I remember I went to an event that you were throwing pre COVID and, uh, 
like sitting in the room and there were all these other people that wanted to not drink. And I just remember learning more about like, actually, you know, kind of what you said, the poison of alcohol, what it actually is. And, and I just felt really like encouraged by that. So you were actually a huge part in that. And, um, yeah, it was just, uh, what I I do really well with structure. And so I said, I'm going to give myself one month off. And that's what made it like attainable for me. Cause if I had said right then and there, I'm going to do a year. I don't think I would have believed in myself. Um, and so I was like, I'm just going to do a month cause I'm really fed up with exactly what you said, having these moments where I think I need to do something different and not doing it because it really is one of those things where it starts to translate to other parts of your life. And so I made this decision to do a month and I started sharing it on social media and I'm like, I'm going to do a month. And I'm like, so many people were like, I want to do that and good for you. And that's great. And I'm like, you know what? I can do a month. I know I can do a month. What would be really like, what if I did a year and I'm like, I'm going to do a year. And I put it out there on social media. Cause I'm like, if I don't do it, I'm not going to hold myself accountable. So I think that's a big thing is like, sometimes you can't, like, sometimes you don't, you know, that's why it's so important to have the support and to have a network. And I just put it out there and I was like, Hey everyone, I'm doing this for a year. So I'm like, I, and I had moments sometimes, you know, like the freaking pandemic hit in the middle of this. And I'm like, but I'm just like, but all those people, you know, who would probably not even remember, but in my mind, I was like, I can't let them down. And then what I started to notice is over time, because there is sort of this period where like, I'd say the first few months were very difficult because it's a lifestyle change. It's not like I had withdrawals or anything, but it's like suddenly certain people that used to be interesting to hang out with weren't as fun to hang out with because you're not, you don't have like the buffer of alcohol to, to kind of make you friends with everyone. And I'm like, ah, okay. I was starting to gravitate more toward people who would rather go on a hike on a Saturday morning than a drink on Friday night. So I was actually getting this, a lot of positive reinforcement. And once I started to adjust my lifestyle, it just became easier and easier and easier. Um, but there was definitely a period and I, I, I feel like this is what stops a lot of people is it's almost like the first three months were really difficult, but once I got past that, um, Oh, and another thing just to add in, I actually got really bad skin at one point and I never really had, I had this crazy acne all of a sudden. I'm like, where is this coming from? And a friend of mine was like, well, you're detoxing. Like your liver is detoxing. That stuff's going to come out. I'm like, ah, this is supposed to make my skin better. <laughs> and then eventually it did, but you know, everything yeah. was hard at first and then it was so much easier. Yeah. Congratulations on taking that first step. Uh, because that's the hardest one for most yeah. people, certainly in my experience. Uh, just to share uh, a similar story to my own story, I remember it was back in Austin, Texas in 2010, mm-hmm. March of 2010, and I'd had two Bombay Sapphire gin and tonics at an industry party on a Friday night. And I didn't get drunk, but I, I got a taxi back to uh, my hotel, which is about 20 minutes north of, of Austin. Went to, went to bed, woke up in the morning, looked in the mirror, and I just felt like I looked weathered. You know, I looked tired. I'd put on about 20 pounds or so over the course of a year. You know, I just kind of crept up. And I just remember feeling like, blah, like, man, I feel like a 6 out of 10 here. And I went to an IHOP, an international house of pancakes, right next door to the hotel I was staying in. And I looked out the window, and it was an overcast day, and it wasn't, particularly nice view out the window it was of a, of a of a freeway or a highway and there were some pretty unhealthy looking um people eating or you can eat pancakes with maple syrup and whipped cream and and the ihop have these big bright menus with photos of the food and i was, remember just going oh man i just feel average it wasn't like i was hung over it wasn't like i was rock bottom it wasn't like i was waking up in a ditch or i'd got a dui or anything like that it was just i felt for the first time, alcohol is is really holding me back. It's really just making me feel average. And so that was my kind of moment where I committed, like you, to just doing 30 days. 
And I had no idea that I was going to go a decade because it's now, you know, coming up 11 years uh, since I've had a drop of alcohol. But at the time it was like 30 days. I can manage that. I can, I can manage 30 days or at least I think I can. And that was all it took for me to step into that, to get the ball rolling, to get the momentum going. And then from there, one month turned into two, turned into three, and then turned into six. And then I got confidence as I as I went along. And it seems like you had a similar experience in that initially you were thinking, I, I'll go for 30 days. And then that turned into 60 days and then 90 days and then six months. So it seems like we have a similar story in, in that we didn't say, I'm never going to drink again. It was mm-hmm. a bite-sized goal. Does that feel... Does that resonate Absolutely. with you? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, and I think that's like sometimes, you know, we see it even with like if someone goes on a diet and then they just do an extreme where they, by the way, is that dog? Can can you hear the dog? Oh, great. I can't hear the dog. No. Right. Just real life happening, real life happening. Here. <laughs> um, but if you go on a diet and you just decide to cut everything out, the chances of you sustaining that are very low. I think if you're like, okay, I'm going to you know, ease off on some sugar and then you can do less sugar and then you do less, less and less. And then eventually you get to a place where you maybe only have sugar in an apple or something. But I think anything that's that extreme, you know, having an expectation of, I will never drink again. It's like that uh, very, I mean, I think it's different. I do want to distinguish because I think it's very different when you're someone who's like in the program of AA versus someone who's making a choice based on, you know, lifestyle perhaps. And, and so I do think I, for example, my ex when I was 25 was, uh, two years into AA, I think when we started dating and I actually went to a lot of the AA uh, meetings with him, like that you could bring friends and family, which is kind of how I got into personal development. Actually, I was like, Whoa, 12 steps taking responsibility. Like there's a lot of good stuff there, but he was the kind of person where the way he described it was if he had one drink, he would, you know, maybe wake up on the beach with cocaine in his pocket, which happened. (laughs) So it's like, I think there's sort of this, there is something to be said about. And while I never will like, you know, know how to advise someone on that. It's like what I experienced in watching him is he's someone who has to say, I will never drink again. That works for him. So that's different than someone like me who, if I said, I will never drink again, that's like, that feels like a goal that wouldn't be something that I would achieve, which would make me feel bad about myself because I have a very different reason for not wanting to drink than he does. And so I think it's, it's really up to you as an individual. I think we all know this deep in our gut. Um, and so there's, yeah, I just felt like that was very important to point out. Um, I kind of forgot your original question, though. <laughs> oh, good. So uh, I'm I'm curious, uh, what were the, you mentioned the skin, like a lot of the toxins were coming out through yeah. your skin and your skin was about, you're probably thinking, man, this quitting drinking stuff is terrible. I hate it. Let me get back to the drink so my skin looks better. Um, yes. <laughs> tell, tell us what were the irritations or the seemingly bad mm. things that happened when you stopped drinking and then what did you notice were the good things the seemingly good positive things that happened when you stopped drinking so what were the bad what were the good yeah i mean i think for me that the skin thing was big because i had this idea just an expectation that like i'm going to stop i remember seeing these slideshows of people who would stop drinking that just looked like 20 years younger and just you know amazing And then I'm like, I look worse. So (laughs) that's like, and also it was really interesting. I lost like a lot of my, um, like I had like, and this could just be getting older, but I had like chubbier cheeks before and I'm like losing all this weight in my face. And I'm like, wait a minute. I didn't want to lose the weight in my face. (laughs) I have like long features already. I'm like, I want those cheeks. Um, so that was interesting, (laughs) but like, but here's the alternative of like such a superficial thing. Like once I, you know, got a lot of the, I don't know, maybe let's say for two weeks, I had really bad acne, but then my skin was like, so clear under eye bags and darkness started to go away. My eyes just looked brighter. I looked more alive. 
um, energy level was just like, it's funny because at first talking about the downside, I had less energy and I could not figure out why. And I realized that going out and having a drink is sugar. Like you're putting sugar into your body. So I'd go out and I'd be like, oh, it's 930. I'm exhausted. Why could I stay up so late before? I'm like, I was drinking sugar. <laughs> like, I'm not drinking sugar anymore. So um, stuff like that I would notice. But um, another thing too, I think uh, I started to become more aware of anxiety I have. You know, when you're drinking, you suppress that a lot of the time. And then it's often worse the next day. But uh, there's sort of a, you know, going to bed at night, all of a sudden I'm sober. I have to deal with all my thoughts, conversations mm. that I could have had differently, things I have to do that I didn't do. Whereas, you know, have a glass of wine before bed, usually I'd be right out. And so that's why I had to learn about breath work and meditation and all these other things that again, like they're all healthier in the long run, but there for sure was a period that, um, yeah, all those difficulties came up. I mean, did you have that? Yeah, I, I had more social difficulties in the first two weeks because I, I, I was worried what people were thinking. In fact, I went on a date with a, a woman named Andrea to the Jones Bar on Santa Monica Boulevard in West Hollywood, and I got to the date at uh, 7.15. The date started at 7.30, and I made a deal with the barman that when I ordered drinks, for my date and I, that he was to make it look as if he was make, making me a vodka soda, but in actual fact, just give me a soda because I was so afraid of what my date would think if I told her that I was going, I was trying being alcohol free. I didn't want to make her feel uncomfortable and I didn't want to feel uncomfortable with her thinking that I was uncomfortable or, or that it was an uncomfortable situation. So uh, I also experienced a little bit of irritability and some broken sleep in the first week, but then it changed. The physical aspects of it changed after about seven to 10 days, and all of a sudden I just started sleeping beautifully. Like you said, the bags under the eyes disappeared, the crow's feet disappeared. In fact, there was a study um, out of the UK, and in fact, a, a similar study out of Sweden just last year that shows that uh, if you stop drinking, like if you stop drinking alcohol, your the visible signs of crow's feet and wrinkles around your eye area reduces by 30 something percent. It's kind of crazy. So, but you know, it takes, it takes a week. It's like, you look at this, if you, if your entire adult life, you've been feeding yourself these toxins. And then, by the way, you don't need to be like getting drunk every night. Even if you just have the occasional seemingly innocent glass or two of wine, if you've been doing that consistently, most of your adult life, and then you start depriving your body of that, there's going to be a period of adjustment. Your body's going to go, hang on, what's going on? I, I, I'm not used to this. In your case, it seems like toxins started coming out through the skin. In my case, there was irritability. My sleep patterns were disrupted. And then, of course, there's the mental game, right, where I'm like, oh, I'm so terrified that what my date's going to think. If I'm not drinking, I'm going to trick her into believing that I am. <laughs> so, you know, there is a period of adjustment, but then this beautiful thing happens. For me, it was seven to 10 days. For other people, it's different. Where all of a sudden you wake up one morning and go, oh, I can feel this now. I can see how my body's starting to operate the way I suspect nature always intended it to operate. This is what I'm supposed to feel. It's not kicked along or fueled by sugar or toxins. Mm etc. It's just fueled by my breath and by uh, good nutrition and by exercise and by sunlight and being outside. And this is the way that nature always intended me to live. That was a bit of a long-winded no, response. No, and, and, and you know, but it, it's, you made a really good point about the irritability that um, for sure was a thing for me too. And the, the, I love that you said the sort of like brought up like the social component of it, because I'll be honest, like I, you know, living in LA, I have a lot of people that don't drink consistently. It's just sort of the culture there. And I did find it to be more of a challenge when I went home to have like, I think it was Thanksgiving or Christmas last year with my family where everyone's drinking wine. 
And that was where I actually missed it the most from a social component. Um, so there are definitely situations where that would come up more than others. And I, I for sure, if you're someone who is like living in an area where you go out and you drink, it's going to be more of a challenge, but you know, with the bigger challenges comes the bigger reward. So I think you will find people just, that's what we do as humans. We find people who are like us. You'll find people who, again, by choosing to not go out and drink, you'll go to bed earlier, which means you'll go to an earlier gym class and you'll meet like minded people, you know, like this will happen, even if it feels lonely at first. And, uh, and so it was interesting too, with the dating thing, cause I am already gluten-free, dairy-free, <laughs> don't eat avocados because these are all allergies. <laughs> so like, it's funny, by the way, people get so upset about avocados in California. They can deal with everything else. They're like avocados. I'm like, <laughs> I'm allergic. It is what it is. <laughs> but then to add on top of that, you know, so poor, you know, we're already trying to figure out a place I can eat. And then I'm like, and I'm not drinking for a year. <laughs> it's like, People must have been like, geez, but I would just make a joke like, yeah, you know, I'm like super high maintenance. I know. Or I'm doing this year and I'm really excited about it. And most people were pretty supportive. I mean, I did have one guy who was a wine maker and he was like, I wish we could just have a glass of wine together. And I'm like, it's my year, man. Like not going to happen. So you, and, and there's sort of this like release again, there's like so many it's not like just quitting alcohol. It's really choosing to elevate, I think, in so many different ways, like being able to sit in comfort with yourself and honoring your boundary and saying, this is what's, this is what I feel is best for me. And I'm not going to worry about what other people think or try to make other people feel comfortable. Like I'm doing this for me. And I'm actually getting emotional thinking about it because there was that shift happened for me where at first I'd kind of like downplay it. And then I got really proud of myself because it took so much for me to get to a place where I was genuinely unaffected and by what other people thought, because I knew I was choosing from a place of self-love and that really reflected in all other areas of my life. I mean, that I think I give this decision credit for me you know, being able to, um, stand in that in many other times, you know, when it comes to dating or making a career choice about, you know, negotiating a a rate for something, but it's like that really set a tone for everything in my life. Yeah. Beautiful. Many people I'm sure listening to you share that will take comfort from that because the social aspect of it and, and feeling confident enough to be able to share with someone whether it's a date or a husband or a wife or friends or peer network or a boss or a colleague or whoever it is it's scary it feels scary doesn't it to be able to at times it can feel scary to actually say to someone i'm choosing to be alcohol free because it brings up there's the danger that someone's going to judge you there's the feeling that people are going to create a story about you there's there's people have shared with me that they feel shame or guilt. They feel like sometimes that the social group that they're with are going to ostracize them from the group. And then, and people's identity feels at, feels threatened. It's like, wow, my entire adult life, I've been a, a drinker, a social drinker, and I've been this person. And now that I'm not, is my social group who are still drinkers, are they going to still accept me? And it sounds like you you had the confidence, you got the confidence, maybe you didn't always have it, but you found that spot where you drew the line and you said, you know what, I'm confident enough now to be able to share, this is my journey, this is who I am. And not a, not a take it or leave it in an aggressive or combative way, but just like, a you know, take it or leave it kind of beautiful, open, this is me type of way. Does that resonate with you? Oh, for sure. And I think one thing is like, I definitely didn't have the confidence in the beginning. I think it was a lot of the confidence was established by not breaking my word to myself. You know, I had made this commitment to myself and it was, it required a lot of discipline. I'm an artist. Like my lifestyle is revolved around nightlife and drinking and being in nightclubs and like, 
you know, playing music until one in the morning in studios where bottles of wine are there, you know, it took like a lot of discipline. And I really, once I got to around the six, seven month mark and I was like, I'm, I am actually really going to do it. And I started to like, because I showed myself that I could, it built this other level of trust in me. It like, honestly, it's a, it's a level I never had before. And it, uh, that's when I noticed the shift, but it's again, by choosing to honor this goal that I had, um, regardless of what was happening around me. And I had never in my adult life been so unwavering with something. And this was the first time I did it. And now it's like, I mean, who would think, you know, it's like, you just think it's like a glass of wine or whatever. But if for me, it was every, it was everything. It shifted everything. Yeah. Beautiful. Congratulations on that. So fast forward now to you, but you were alcohol free for, I think, 18 months. Um, yeah. So you broke up with alcohol for 18 months. And then yeah. <laughs> jokingly, we can say you got back together with alcohol, or maybe in a yeah. different style of relationship. <laughs> so walk us through that process or what happened there where you're seemingly enjoying the benefits of 18 months of the alcohol free lifestyle. And then choosing to drink again, albeit as from what I understand at a far reduced level. So walk us through that. Oh. Yeah, like I can't I, I haven't been drunk again. I just wanna like it's very interesting. I um initially, so here's kind of the way this moment happened. I was in Park City visiting about like one of my best friends. We're sitting um, it's the first time we went out to a restaurant, you know, we're outdoors it's post pandemic sun is setting and I see this glass of wine and I'm like, Oh, you know what? That looks, I would really love to have a glass of wine and a steak right now. And I'm sorry to whoever's vegan. I have lots of vegan friends and this is another ongoing conversation, but for a different time, it's like, I just really would love this as a whole experience. And she said, well, why don't you want to? And I didn't answer with, I, you know, I didn't say like, oh, I've been feeling so good or I've been this or, you know, I was like, oh, I just feel like I'm going to let people down if I do. And she goes, that's interesting. And she's not like a personal development friend of mine or anything. She goes, oh, that's interesting. She just kind of looked at me and I go, all right. And I'm like, well, let me check in with myself. Like, what do I feel expansive or do I feel like I'm making this based on like not wanting to miss out or like, you know, I kind of ran through and I'm like, I actually would really like to have a glass of wine. Like it felt expansive. I, I don't know how else to like another word. And I was like, okay. And I think it was for me realizing that I was at a point where anytime you're making a decision based on other people, I mean, look, there's a difference if you have kids and stuff like that in a family who need you to do something, but like the, I was making it that decision. I realized in that moment based on like the perceived um, disappointment that would happen if I did. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to have a glass. And then I did. And I, I could have like three sips and I was like, that is intense. And it's going right to my head. <laughs> and I was like, oh yeah, that's, that's not a feeling I like, but I enjoyed the taste of a few sips and I was like, cool. And then you know, it's interesting because I, I don't know what happened with me, but it never, the, I'll put it this way. I used to notice I would drink when I was stressed or upset or just doing it, not even consciously, just like I'm out with to dinner. I'm going to get a wine and not think about it because that's what people do. Or this experience was so like, I was smelling it. I was doing all the things they do, like the fancy wine people. I was like swirling it around, you know, I had an experience with it. And I wondered, I'm like, does that mean I'm like drinking again? But it's really interesting because I know how good I feel when I don't get drunk or if I, you know, I just know what it's like. I know what a hangover is like versus not having a hangover. <laughs> and so once in a while, I guess from there, like once in a while, I'll have a glass of wine. But as soon as I do, I like have a ton of water after. I don't ever feel a need to have a second glass. It's like, I, and I, I do not see a world in which I would allow myself to be drunk again. And it's sort of hard to explain because it's like, but there's no part of me that wants to be drunk. And, um, there's no part of me. Literally, I will like, <laughs> if I have a glass of wine, it takes me the whole night 
to have it. Like, and I'm like constantly drinking water in between. And so I really like to see that because of course, you know, you, you break a habit and then it's like, well, am I gonna, is this a risk? And, and again, I think for sure for some people it is, but you know, I'm someone who I found out I was allergic to gluten 12 years ago. I never cheated. I never eat gluten. I never eat dairy. I, I, I don't do these things because of my health. And I think some things you can, you can introduce with allergies. You can reintroduce and your body will have a different reaction if you give enough time. And so alcohol was actually very interesting. It was one of those things. Um, but I do notice, like I can tell the difference now where if I'm stressed out and I'm like, Oh, I'd love a glass of wine. I'm like, Nope, you do not get a glass of wine from that place. (laughs) You get it the same way you'd like, you know, just again, like having that moment of like having a steak and a glass of red wine that feels expansive, being stressed out and wanting a glass of wine does not feel expansive. And I'm like very clear on that. So, you know, it's still a process. Like I would never drink liquor again. I feel clear on that. I'm complete with my liquor journey that's pretty much like rosé and maybe red once in a while. And again, it's very like, it's, um, when it feels right. So, but I don't, I don't have that feeling of needing it to like, you know, have a conversation or have a date or any of those things. And, and so that I think ultimately was, was what I had to break up with. And honestly, like I'm fine either way at this point, like it's not a thing that I really see as a part of my life anymore. Um, so yeah, like I've gone out with people again, it's weird because of COVID, but you know, you might go out to like a distance park picnic or something. And I see wine there. I'm like, yeah, I don't really want it right now. You know, which in the past, I, ne- if there was wine there, I was drinking it. <laughs> so it's like, it's cool. It's like, it's almost like if you break up with someone and then you're like, you give it enough time and you're like, oh, now we can be friends, but it doesn't mean I need to hang out with you every day. We don't have to talk all the time but it's nice to see you in social situations sometimes, you know? Yeah. What you're describing is probably what most people listening would love to get to. Uh, At least Mm. that's what they they think or they feel in the beginning. Um, Many folks, when, once they get, you know, many months behind them of being alcohol free and they get power over it, many folks say, that's it. I'm done. Never again. I don't see any reason why I would, would go back. Other people, I think, maybe who are listening to this who haven't yet started their journey, who want to break up with alcohol, would probably feel some relief, I think, to hear you say that uh, you're able to go 18 months alcohol-free and then powerfully choose to have a drink on occasion, but you have ultimate power over alcohol. Does it feel like that now? Does it feel like you have ultimate power over it? Yeah. And you know how I actually know that is there's not, there's not even a, there's not even any power in the thought of it. Right. Like there was a time where uh, even when I was debating, like, should I stop drinking? I would feel so much power with that. Like, I'd be like, Oh, I can't do it. I can't do it. And now it genuinely is like, I could go either way. You know what I mean? So because of that, I tend to choose not to drink. It's just, it's, it really is one of those things again, where it's situational, where once a month I have red meat, once a month I have a glass of rosé, like once a month I have some sugar, you know, it's like these things. But I do think, you know, I don't know why my body has responded this way. It could be again, just because of the, the way that my mind feels. And I do also feel like if I was going through a really challenging or hard time, I would cut alcohol out again, because I think any, like right now I feel good. I feel strong. But I expect in life, you're going to have peaks and valleys. And I do think in a time like that, I now know that that's a time to not drink anymore. Um, And so everyone's different. I mean, I think it is one of those things where we get these internal messages. And, you know, luckily for me, I never was in a position where I, you know, got into a car accident because of drinking or anything or pulled over anything. Um, I know some people do have those moments. Um, I know people have like affairs. And so, you know, there's a lot of things that can happen. That's like the universe really screaming at you to stop drinking, but sometimes it can be almost more challenging when you just have a feeling, but you don't have like something shake up your life. Um, and I think that's why it's so great with what you're doing because 
like I said to you, I had this thought in my mind for a while, but, you know, connecting with you is one of the things that really, really encouraged me. Cause I'm like, okay, like it's time, you know, I have no excuses. And so like you building this community where people can share their stories with each other and kind of encourage each other. I think it's uh, so great to have something like that. If you're thinking about it, here's the thing. Like if it's something that you feel in your gut, I kind of say, just go for it. Like take a leap and see what happens. Cause nothing really bad's going to happen. <laughs> like when, The bad things don't happen when you stop drinking. <laughs> so it's like, you really don't have anything to lose. Well said. Julia Price, thank you so much for sharing your journey with my community and congratulations yeah. on the growth that you've seemed to have had over the past 18 months and beyond and uh, mm -hmm. long may it continue. And I just want to, if you're comfortable, maybe you might share your uh, social media um, handles where people could reach out to you and just to the, to the listener or the viewer I encourage you, if something spoke to you, if something resonated with you, if something inspired you from Julia and her story today, please do send her a message. Um, Julia, where can people connect with you? Yeah, so I think the easiest way is probably Instagram. It's Julia Price Music. And, I, I, you know, if you Julia Price Music, pretty much any platform, you'll find me. So I'm around. Um, but yeah, I mean, I just want to say to you, thank you again. It, it really, um, and I don't mean to make you feel weird because it's your podcast, but like, <laughs> you know, you're, I don't know if guests usually tell you this, but you really have been so in, like a huge inspiration in me making that choice that ultimately changed my life. So I'm really grateful and, um, you know, grateful that you built such a strong community around similar values. So it's really an honor to come here and talk about this. And, you know, I think that I'm like even surprised how much I talked about it because I'm, uh, I'm really excited about it. <laughs> like, it's just, I'm like, I have so many feelings about this. So thank you for giving me space to just, you know, talk and talk and talk. <laughs> You're so welcome. And uh, thank you for sharing that with me I, it really touches my heart so julia price thank you again so wonderful to see you thank you for sharing your story and uh all the success in the world with your career and your health and your mindset and everything moving forward thank you again thank you thanks for listening to the alcohol free lifestyle podcast i want to load you up with some free stuff right now so if you want to go to jameswanick.com slash guide i will send you my quit alcohol guide which has helped six figure entrepreneurs and top professionals reduce or quit drinking you can also text the word quit guide to the number 44222 if you're in the u.s of course it doesn't really work anywhere outside of the u.s but if you're in the u.s on your mobile phone and you'd like that guide text the word quit guide to the number 44222 or you can go to jameswanick.com slash guide. If you'd like to schedule a free 15-minute call with one of my top coaches, just an exploratory call to see if or how we can help you, then you can go to jameswanick.com slash schedule, or you can text the word project90 to the number 44222 if you're listening in the US on a mobile phone. That's jameswanick.com slash schedule, or you can text the word project90, that's one word, project90, to the number 44222. Feel free to send me a direct message over on my Instagram account, which is at James Swanick. You can also watch video episodes of this podcast and a series of other educational videos on my YouTube channel, which is James Swanick One, or you can direct message me on Facebook at James Swanick Official. And finally, a request. Would you please now write a short review of the podcast inside of the Apple Podcast app on your phone or on iTunes on your desktop? Computer. Would you please give the show five stars and write a quick one or two sentence review? This will help the show get in front of even more listeners, potentially transforming someone's life. You can rate and review the show inside of your Apple podcast app on your phone or over on iTunes on your desktop. Thank you so much and I'll catch you next time. <laughs>